Welcome everybody to what is going to be a third series of lectures. The first two series were specifically to introduce undergraduates to economics and to introduce undergraduates to degrees in banking and finance. This third series of lectures are a miscellaneous group of lectures which expand upon points I've made when I've introduced topics uh, or their particular points of interest argument that over the years undergraduates have found uh, interesting and I hope indeed you find them interesting. The first one I've chosen to give you was a lecture I was asked to give to uh, a university politics society. It was their inaugural meeting, very brave of them bearing in mind uh, that uh, many of them knew my thoughts on uh, politicians and that I didn't hold them in much esteem. And the title that I offered them was uh, Does the Economy Need Politicians and Politics? And in order to set the scene for them, uh, I needed to distinguish between right and left in economics and in politics. These terms are often misused uh, and I wanted to set them quite clearly within a context that people could understand whether you were talking about right and left from the point of view of economics or whether this was the political right and left. And I used this slide, you'll see what I mean if I go through this slide with you. I'm sorry it's got to be presented to you on a piece of paper rather than... Um, as a slide and I'll have to talk behind it to you. I trust that you can uh, uh, read it okay. But uh, the, the title of the slide was Intervention by the Percentage of National Income Spent by Government. Now I can quite easily distinguish right and left in an economic sense uh, and I hope uh, to be able to do it in uh, a political sense using uh, this particular slide. Uh, as far as economics is concerned, the, the right here is when there is no government. So there is no percentage of national income that is spent by government and you are in a situation which would often be described uh, as uh, an anarchy. That is uh, an economy that's working uh, but there's no government, therefore there's no percentage of uh, national income that's spent by government. My centre, and it's fairly arbitrary, is 25%. So if the government are spending 25% of national income on your behalf, then I've, I've positioned them in the centre. And my left, in terms of, uh, of politics, uh, sorry, economics, to start with, my left is as we move towards 50% of uh, national income being spent by government or 50% uh, plus. Now, democratic politics comes in a very narrow band which is now to the left of what I would call the economic centre. So it's this band here. So this is where UK politics is, it's where actually all democratic politics has, uh, has moved to. And we, we've got a left and right there for politics, which is very much left of centre. And theoretically, uh, we would have the Tory party being to the right of this left of centre column and the Labour party being slightly to the left. Now pop the Liberal Dems. Uh, some of you may remember them in the middle so that you will get an idea that there was a, a central party between them. But basically because in a democracy you're trying to get the majority of votes, all political parties have to say more or less the same thing with just marginal differences that they describe as being right wing or left wing. But really the the politics here is almost identical. In fact, you know, looking back in history, the sort of Tories and the Labour Party could even switch positions here because when the Labour Party is in power, 
it has to bend over backwards to get the support of big business. So it tends to do quite a lot of good uh, uh, Tory party capitalist things. When the Tory party is in power, exactly the opposite. It has the support of big business, so it wants to get the support of the working man of the trade unions. Uh, and it tends to bend over backwards uh, so that, uh, sometimes jokingly, but not really, I would argue that one of the best uh, Tory prime ministers that we have had, probably second best, uh, um, would be Tony Blair. And one of the best Labour Party uh, um, Prime Ministers would be Ted Heath, uh, because uh, uh, Ted Heath did many uh, good uh, left-wing socialist, socialist, socialist things in his term of office as uh, leader of the Tory party. So it's all a little mix in a very narrow band towards um, somewhere spending between 35 and 45 per cent of, uh, of national income is spent by government. And you can see along the sort of bottom line there, your right is anarchy. Capitalism, with some government intervention, which I'll explain is important a little bit later on, uh, would be certainly spending a lot less than 25% of the national income. And then as you move further left and you move through the different types of socialism towards communism, uh, you're getting to 50% plus of the ability of the nation to produce an income is taken away and spent on your behalf by the government. Now reintroduce the economists into this and uh, I like to think of my right and left in terms of the degree to which economists and economic schools of thought want to intervene in the economy because the more you intervene, the greater must be the proportion of national income you spend. Now, to me, left of centre comes this group of economists, the Keynesian economists, the modern monetary theorists. These are economists where the school of thought tells them that if they intervene, if they do things, if they tax people, spend, borrow, do lots of things in the economy to stabilise it, to cause it to grow, to create full employment, um, uh, then uh, they would have to spend a large proportion of national income and they become what I would call interventionist economists. They want to uh, intervene and manage uh, the economy. And then to the uh, right of centre, you've got uh, other schools of thought, monetarists, Austrians, that recognise that there are problems with government intervention and they want less government intervention, minimal government, limited government, and they think that that links much closer to the ideals of capitalism, is government spending a smaller proportion of national income and doing much less intervention in the economy. So I go through this slide with them, sort of trying to get the idea over to them that politics democratic politics comes within a very narrow band, spending quite a large proportion of the national income that will put them left of centre as far as uh, an economist would see. And that the schools of thought, the economists that advise within this band are schools of thought like Keynesians, like modern monetary theorists. The monetarists, the Austrians, they come nowhere near this column here. Whoops, where is it there? come nowhere near that column there. Uh, so really they wouldn't be considered as uh, uh, advisors or people that politicians would listen to. And if you go vertically above them, you'll see the initials JBH, which are my initials, which is where I sit, which is one of the reasons that I have to talk to um, people because politicians wouldn't listen to me uh, because I tell them nothing that they want to hear. I tell them that they need to do a lot less in the economy if we want the economy to function efficiently. So we start with um, that slide just to, to set the scene so that there's no confusion when I talk about economics left and right and I talk about politics left and right. So if we go back to the original title that I gave to the Politics Society, it was, Does the Economy Need Politicians and Politics? 
I'd love to say no, they don't need them. But unfortunately, the answer is yes, we do need politics and we do need politicians uh, under any circumstances uh, from uh, autocracies and monarchists and uh, um, democracy. We need politicians. We don't, however, need politicians because government ever does anything efficiently. In fact, by definition, government is always inefficient and wasteful in the things that it does. So I'm not arguing that there are things government has got to do because it does them efficiently. I'm arguing that there are things government has to do because there's no alternative. I'll explain a little bit more about that in a moment. But to understand the difference, the point that I'm trying to make here, all you've got to do is look at the profit motive, which the private sector uh, is aiming to make profits. That is, it's aiming to buy resources, mix them together, produce goods and services, sell those goods and services, and make a profit. If it covers its costs and make a profit, then it will expand and grow, and it is satisfying customer demand, and in an economic sense, that is more efficient in the way that you allocate resources. If you think of politicians, you can give them another motive, but it's the vote motive. It's not the profit motive. Politicians are voted, uh, sorry, politicians are motivated by their ability to achieve votes, attract people to vote for them. And of course, that basically means uh, saying lots of things that people wouldn't be prepared to pay for, but if they think they're going to get it for nothing, then they're quite happy to support politicians who say, yes, we can do this, yes, we can do this, yes, we can do that, yes, we're going to um, run your country for you and, uh, and do all the comforting things that you would uh, like us to do. And there's no measure of efficiency here other than did you vote them into power uh, because that's all they're concerned with is saying things to you that will gather votes for them. So by definition, it's going to be inefficient. There's going to be no measure of whether or not the customer wants what is happening. Uh, it's just a case of would you vote for somebody who said they were going to do that for you and leave you with the view that they would be able to do it at no cost to you. So the profit motive creates efficiency. The vote motive creates inefficiency. So I would love to say, no, we don't need politicians and government, uh, but I can't say that. Uh, and therefore, I'm going to say, well, there's limited things that we would have to have uh, governments doing. And we need uh, perhaps not to move outside those limits. To understand uh, the next part, then, I need to introduce to you something which is an important distinction between free goods and economic goods. If a product needs an allocative mechanism, it might be a price mechanism, it might be a command, it might be someone saying you can have it, you can have it, but you can't. If resources and products need allocative mechanisms, then they are economic goods. Free goods are those things where there's just enough of them around for us not to need an allocative mechanism. So air, we, can, we all need air to breathe. It's free, there's enough of it around. We don't need to have anyone allocate resources uh, to that. But if the resources and the products require allocative mechanisms, then in economic terms, they're always scarce is the word used. The layman often makes a, a difference between scarce and abundant. Economists don't do that um, because you might say sands uh, abundant, uh, diamonds are scarce, uh, but to economists they're all scarce because sand needs allocative mechanisms in order to dis distribute it through markets in the same way that, uh, that diamonds do. Uh, so uh, there are degrees of scarcity, but all economic goods, the things that you want, goods and services, all economic products are uh, scarce, need a mechanism to allocate them. Now, I suppose just to illustrate that point, uh, I did say air was a free good, but of course, uh, fresh air isn't. Fresh air isn't a free good in certain areas. For example, if you go to Los Angeles, it's in a uh, it's in a valley. A lot of pollutants are sort of captured in the atmosphere there, and uh, the air isn't particularly fresh. In fact, if you you look around Los Angeles, you will see people with little backpacks 
and oxygen masks on because they want fresh air. Now they have to pay for that because fresh air is scarce. Air isn't, but fresh air is. So hopefully that gives you an idea of what the difference is between free goods and economic goods. And we can move on to deal with why government must intervene. I've said that uh, they're not efficient, but I actually do want them. These are the reasons why I need governments to intervene. And that is because there are certain products which have characteristics that mean they wouldn't be supplied in a marketplace. Markets would totally fail for these products. And they are called, and it's again precise economic terminology here, they are called public goods. And there are uh, sort of two extremes of economic goods. There's the public good at one extreme and then the private good at the other extreme. Now, the public good is a collective consumption good. They're things that you all want, but you're not prepared to pay for. You're not prepared to pay for them because they, they have characteristics of being non-rival and non-excludable. Now, all that means is that if I produce them for one person, I can't stop anyone else consuming them. And if, as a consumer, I consume one of these products, I don't reduce the amount that's available for other people to consume. This means that no one would be prepared to buy these products, but we all want them. They're things like law and order, internal defence, external defence, the classic example in almost any economics textbook is street lighting. You want street lighting to feel safe at night, uh, but you're not prepared to pay for it uh, because uh, anyone else can have an advantage of street lights. You put lights outside your front door uh, so that you know where to put your key in uh, and to protect you, but you won't put one out in the street. Uh, you want it, but you won't put it there. That's where we come down to thinking of a third party has got to supply these products and buy these products on your behalf. And you will be better served for having them, but you wouldn't be prepared to buy them. Uh, and this is the main reason, there are other reasons, but this is the main reason why you need a third party, I'm quite happy to say a government, to manage the supply of public goods, to deal with law and order, internal defence, external defence, all the rules and regulations, look after uh, your water supplies uh, and uh, your street lighting, etc., because a market would fail for these products. Now that's, I don't know, 5 to 10% of, uh, of, of products, probably 5% I should think. The other 95% are all private goods. Now these have the characteristics of being rival and excludable. So if I produce them for you, no one else can have them. If you consume them, you can consume them and no one else can consume these products. Things like food, clothing, entertainment, um, things like this are private goods, private to you, rival and excludable. They have an allocative mechanism. That allocative mechanism is market. And markets can work efficiently. And indeed, I'm OK with a little bit of government intervention here because I want rules and regulations that make these markets fair for all competing members of these markets. And so the provision of the rules and regulations is actually a public good. We all want that, but we're not prepared to pay for that. We are prepared to pay for these products and therefore these markets work. And so I would like to see all, almost all products produced in an economy uh, done through um, a capitalist free market situation where private goods are allocated through a price mechanism. Now, there are some private goods that have significant external benefits to society. And there are some private goods that have significant external costs to society. So I'm OK for governments to intervene here to a certain extent. So the private goods that have significant external benefits to society are called merit goods. So the big examples here are health and education. The markets are imperfect. They're private goods. So there would be marketplaces for health and education without government. 
but because of the significant external benefits to society of having a well-educated, healthy workforce, uh, people uh, in that society, uh, then I'm happy for there to be government support for these merit goods. I'll explain more in just a moment. Before that, though, I will introduce the demerit goods to you because the demerit goods are those that have significant external costs to society and produce uh, imperfect markets. They're uh, the, the products which produce lots of pollutants, lots of damage to the environment if they're not managed uh, um, under precise rules and regulations for individuals. Smoking, uh, alcohol consumption, gambling, all of these things uh, could, if people consume them to the level at which they um, do, uh, could impose costs upon society. Uh, and you know what the National Health Service costs of people smoking are, of people becoming addicted to alcohol, etc. So I'm setting out here, or we're setting out on the, in this lecture, the framework within which I would consider that uh, governments need to intervene in the economy. So the next question becomes, how much should government intervene in the economy? So let's start by just looking at the public good, you know, internal defence, external defence, law and order, um, street lighting. A third party has got to buy those. It's in fact the only and very good reason for taxation is to take money away from people's income to pay for things that they want to collectively consume but would not buy. So I'm quite happy for the government to buy. In some cases, the government also has got to supply these products, but not in all cases. For example, uh, if the government decides that uh, this new housing estate has got to have street lighting, uh, it can buy the street lighting from private companies. They can supply the street lighting. But the important thing is the government, national or local, whatever it is, has got to pay for the introduction of um, uh, these resources. So public goods is an area where you've got to have government and you need politics, if you like, to allocate these resources as best they can. Won't be done efficiently, remember, but it wouldn't be done at all otherwise. So the government has got to get involved in supplying these public goods. Now, lots of argument among economists for the two merit goods, the big ones that I've identified, education and health. And uh, there will be economists that will disagree with me and are not absolutely certain about uh, uh, the proportions that should be uh, spent on education and health, but I'll say a little bit about each so that you're clear on uh, what I mean. I'm okay if we look at education with private education, have no problem at all with people who want to send their children to private schools. And in fact, I might even go so far as to say that if people send their children to private schools, then they should get uh, tax relief. Uh, for, for doing that because they're reducing the um, extent to which the government has got to pay for their children's education. So I'm okay with private education, but I want a good state education system because the benefit to society of educating people as well as they can be educated uh, is not distributed uh, in the same way as income is. So people wouldn't be necessarily be able to buy educations, but those children would definitely benefit society because of skills that they have if they had a strong education. And I have been through the UK education system, attended grammar school, uh, taught in uh, uh, sixth form colleges, observed what's going on, and I have no doubt at all what we need is a state education system, which is comprehensive. So I'm despite going to a grammar school. I'm not in favour of grammar schools. I don't, I'm quite happy for there to be a grammar school stream in a comprehensive school. I don't mind children being able to move up and down and compete to be in the top sets. That's absolutely fine. In fact, that's beneficial. But I would have 11 to 16 comprehensive schools all feeding to sixth form college from sort of 16 to 18 and then on to university. My observation is the best education you can possibly 
get and it worked for a short while late 70s early 80s and then the government got involved and destroyed uh, that system but there's no reason why we shouldn't think of trying to get it back so I'm state education private education there's a role for government there health service same way i'm quite happy for there to be a private health service and people uh, uh, buying health service uh, whenever they like but i want a good state national health service here um, there's a big advantage of having a monopsonistic that's a sole buyer of medicine it's a sort of counterbalance against the pharmaceutical countries it can keep their prices down if you get lots of hospitals and uh, health authorities competing uh, for uh, medicines and pharmaceutical products then the price that can will actually be higher but a sole buyer can actually get uh, the price of uh, pharmaceutical products and, and medicine medicinal products lower and from my point of view that's a great advantage in having a national health service unfortunately it doesn't work particularly efficiently because we have the problem of growing bureaucracy in uh, the both education and health that I would like to remove if I possibly could and I'll say a little bit more about that uh, in just a moment but you can see here that there is something which could work because if I want to encourage people to take up more education, to educate themselves to the highest possible level, uh, I really need to, to subsidise these merit goods. I want governments to subsidise these in some ways. If I want to discourage people from polluting the environment, uh, from smoking too much, drinking too much, gambling too much, I can tax them. And no doubt you can see yourself. Surely there's a, something here that could work. You could be taxing demerit goods and subsidising merit goods. More about that later. So I would think that government doing that, limited government doing that, is really all I want them to do. I need them to balance their budgets. Interventionist economists, Keynesians, modern monetary theorists, they make mistakes by talking about budget deficits and uh, well Keynesians talk about budget surpluses but we never actually get any. The simple thing is for governments if you want to spend money then raise it in the form of taxation. Everyone can see what you're doing and because in my society government will be spending a lot less then I would be quite happy to force balanced budgets on governments legally and I would also instruct central banks uh, to achieve an inflation target, 2%, uh, not because it's good, but it's the best that uh, can be achieved. If you look in my previous lectures, you'll understand why. Um, and I'd like them to do it without manipulating interest rates. So how much should government intervene? It's just that much. Provide the public good, support the merit good, finance it with a balanced budget and manage monetary demand by setting clear targets for a central bank which doesn't allow them to manipulate interest rates and cause the problems that they've caused with speculative bubbles and all of those things you notice in asset markets now. And again, more is said about those on in other lectures of mine. So how much, if we do that, would government be spending? Well, if we go back to the beginning of the 20th century, the UK government was spending about 10% of the nation's income. Now it wasn't doing certain things, no national health service or education, so 10% will be much too low. Um, government spending reached a peak in 2010 when the government was spending just under, well 44.9, just under 45% of national income was spent by government. We're going to have an exceptional year this year, of course. This is now 2021 and governments have been spending enormous amounts of money trying to deal with a pandemic. So we are going to have a peak which is much higher than any previous peak. Uh, so bear that in mind when you're listening to this lecture and hopefully um, seeing us going through a recovery because what I'm saying to you is where we need to get back to uh, then so it's not precise uh, but my guess is that if we limit government spending to providing the public goods supporting the provision of merit goods 
then probably about 20% of the nation's income would suffice. Governments need not be spending more than 20% of national income to do all the things that I think that they should do. That's going to be a problem because you've got to step uh, from a very large proportion of the nation's income being spent by government all the way down to 20%, uh, which is, it's really a guesstimate from my point of view. I, I need some of my PhD students to, to work all the costs out here uh, for me, and then I'll add my name and, and say, well, it was my idea. Um, there are obvious things you can do because in all areas of government spending, there are significant bureaucratic savings. That means getting rid of bureaucracy. And that can be done quite easily by just stop measuring process and just investigate poor outcomes. Good illustration in education and health. You don't have to measure the process of education, measure the process of health. You just look at outcomes. And if outcomes are good, you leave things alone. If outcomes aren't, you investigate. I, I won't mention the name, but uh, I taught in a college where there were, when I first went there, around 80 people teaching and about a thousand students. And there were 13 support staff. Talking to someone teaching there a few years ago, uh, there are now 3,000 students. There are uh, around 90 people teaching those students, so hardly any more than before. But Rather than just 13 support staff, there's now 120 plus support staff. Um, that's the sort of thing that I would like to revert to something a little bit simpler and more basic. Because if hospitals have much higher deaths than any other hospital, by all means investigate them. If everyone's happy with the hospital and it got great outcomes, forget investigating. You don't need to follow it through. You just look at the outcomes. Same for schools. Schools, everyone is happy with the school and all the students are doing well. You don't need to investigate and measure their processes. Uh, but if there's a problem, then by all means investigate. I mean, there's huge bureaucratic savings just by stop looking at process and investigate only poor outcomes. So how much will it cost? I don't know. But I wouldn't go much above 20% of national income being spent by government to create an efficient economy which will then saw with uh, um, capitalism, free markets, uh, growing the economy at much faster rates than we have ever seen before. So what's my blueprint for politics, politicians and the economy? Well, I would like as much capitalism as possible, as many resources and products allocated through a price mechanism. Uh, and OK a role for government because they set the rules of the game and make sure that everything is uh, fair and uh, there are level playing fields. But uh, I want as much capitalism as possible. I don't really want government to spend more than that 20% of national income and I think that is achievable. Governments balancing their budget, uh, well at least until we get back to, say, uh, government spending as a proportion of income, 20%, and government borrowing as a proportion of the national debt, um, sorry, as a proportion of GDP, so national debt to GDP, national debt no more than 30% of GDP, over 100% now, so a long way to go to sort of bring it back uh, to a manageable level. Um, obviously, I've got a blueprint for the Bank of England where they target 2% inflation. Bearing in mind they can do that, they can't do anything else, but they can do that, and I want them to do it without manipulating interest because I know they can do that as well. Uh, so that uh, would work for me. I'm obviously concerned uh, about uh, um, poor and poverty, and that's a problem that can be quite easily dealt with uh, through reverse income tax. You just need to have a system whereby everyone over the age of 18 uh, can access a reverse income tax, or what Milton Friedman called a negative income tax. And 
that would really remove the whole welfare system. There's no need to have a welfare system taking money, keeping some of it, and then handing it out to, uh, to poor and underprivileged uh, people. I'd have a very small welfare system, a welfare benefits system, uh, which deals with people who have been registered as unable to look after themselves as a result of physical disabilities and mental disabilities. They are the people who need access to welfare benefits. No one else does. So everyone uh, over the age of 18 would then just qualify for a reverse income tax, would, act would actually provide them with a basic income. It's almost like a universal basic income, but it's not universal. It only applies to those people who haven't got an income high enough to support their, the minimum requirements the civilised society would want its people to achieve. So that's what I would like to see in society. I, it, it would produce growing capitalist society, which, and I've explained this in other lectures, actually increases equality uh, and uh, that means that the one important thing, everyone can become better off without having to make other people worse off, which is what happens when economies don't grow and economies don't grow if governments exceed their targets for spending uh, because, go back to the original point, the more they spend, the more inefficient these resources uh, are, more inefficiently these resources are allocated and that means there's low and no economic growth and economic growth is the only thing that can make us all better off. So there's my nightmare, of course, uh, because uh, uh, I want uh, those things to happen, but I don't see them happening. Uh, there is an inexorable move towards more and more state control in every country of the world, uh, including all our democracies. And I've noticed it over my lifetime. Governments are spending a greater and greater proportion of your income to do, as they say, wonderful things. Uh, but this move could take us almost through democracy into a command economy. Remember the communist revolutions, uh, they um, tried to turn economies into command economies very quickly. Uh, it didn't work, they rather rushed things and uh, uh, it all fell apart. But they it, well, basically because it was a deception, what uh, the communist revolutions did was a sort of wealth trick. Uh, over a 24-hour period, they removed private property rights. They said there are now no longer any private property rights. So we all are equal owners of all of the wealth of the country. We've created equality overnight, but of course that doesn't mean standard of living. Your standard of living is determined by the resources you can command and the communist revolutions still created lots of rich people who lived in big houses who had uh, the servants and uh, and the big cars uh, and it really just replaced if you like um, one elite uh, with uh, another elite so I worry that what we're doing now is moving towards this command type of economy the thing communist revolution tried and it failed and we're sort of slipping closer and closer to that and unfortunately the pandemic has accelerated that process because governments are introducing more and more controls and the one thing you know is it's very difficult to take control away from government once you've given it to them and in a democracy who do you vote for? You vote for politicians who say they're going to do something. You wouldn't vote for a politician who said they're going to do nothing on a particular issue. I mean, my students always say to me, why don't you get things done and why don't you stand in politics? And I have to say, no one would vote for me. Well, some would vote for me, but no one, uh, not enough people would vote for me to give me any position of power because I can't say that I can do much over and above the things I've described here. So if I'm standing up against someone else 
who doesn't understand this and just says, yes, we can do that. We can create a much uh, safer society. We can have a society with much more compassion in it. We can help everybody. Who do you vote for? Do you vote for the person who says, sorry, I, I can't see um, that we can do anything here. It's much better if we leave it to markets and leave it to capitalism. You don't vote for that person. You vote for that person who says that they can do all of these wonderful things. I often say to my students, who would you vote for? If you've got this politician here who says, I'm going to do all of these things, uh, uh, and the alternative is someone who says, no, I'm not going to do anything. I just want you to vote for me. I'm going to go up to uh, um, the Houses of Common and uh, eat, drink, be merry, enjoy myself and do absolutely nothing. Unfortunately, the person who does absolutely nothing will probably be the better uh, for society uh, than the person who tries to do absolutely everything and solve all your problems uh, for you. And, uh, and, and not produce the outcomes that uh, you want. It's very difficult to understand not intervening in society. It's much easier to understand someone who says they're going to intervene. If I said to you now, the best way out of our current problems is for the government to cut expenditure and for interest rates to be raised by raising bank rate to 5%, You'd say I was absolutely bonkers. You'd say, no, it's exactly the other way. Governments got to spend much more money as they're doing during the pandemic. Look at all the wonderful things they're doing. Furlough, spend lots of money, government. And indeed, Bank of England, they're thinking of getting interest rates negative, not putting them up to 5%. They're going down to negative. Those are the things that sound great to us because if we can borrow at... Uh, uh, a negative rate of interest and if governments can spend money and borrow at a negative rate of interest won't we all be better off and won't everything be wonderful um, well again you can uh, answer that question but you can see why it would be very difficult for me to stand up in front of you and say no it's time for governments to cut their expenditure and for the Bank of England to put the bank rate up to 5% and then we will all get back to a much higher standard of living and be better off in the future as I don't say, you think I would be bonkers, wouldn't you? Brexit was great because Brexit was something that removed a layer of uh, international political bureaucracy. Remember, all political systems are wasteful. So, um, you know, I have enough with a national political system being wasteful. I didn't want another international bu political bureaucracy above it being uh, wasteful as well. There's a good reason for having international bodies, particularly at a legal level. But I don't like international political bodies because they, they do add to the category of just wasting your hard-earned incomes. So my nightmare, unfortunately, is there's this exact inexorable move towards command economies and we will find ourselves, perhaps in the next 10 years, living under a command economy with very little uh, private free enterprise uh, as much of it has been destroyed during this uh, pandemic by dealing with it incorrectly of course I'll add but perhaps I'll do another lecture um, on that one uh, for you so that would have been because it was 45 minutes I was allocated that, that would have been about the, the time that uh, I had available for this lecture I did add and always like to have quotations around uh, in, in case there's a, a few minutes uh, left over. And I did have some quotations, which if you don't mind, I'll go through a little more slowly because I think they illustrate the fact that there are lots of economists and thinkers out there who do agree with what I say, even though the majority disagree. Pedro Schwartz, uh, um, his quotation I like, because he said, uh, we have reached the state where the private sector is that part of the economy the government controls and the public sector is that part that nobody controls. So I won't give you five minutes to think about it, but uh, it, that was a nice quotation. Think about it at your leisure. Hugh Thomas wrote a book, The Unfinished History of the World, and when he looked at uh, the history of the world, he came to that conclusion. He said, I have attributed to the intervention of the state the decay of civilizations and the collapse of society. His research in history 
whenever the state gets involved in doing more and more, that's when society collapses, that's when civilization collapse, so, collapses. So another one for you to think about, a lawyer, 19th century uh, lawyer, A.V. Dicey, uh, said something uh, which I thought was interesting. He said the beneficial effect of state intervention, especially in the form of legislation, but can apply to other things, of course, especially in the form of legislation is direct, immediate, and so to speak, visible, whilst its evil effects are gradual and indirect and lie out of sight. You know, within the modern context, what the government does always looks great when it first does it, but there are unintended consequences which are not uh, as uh, was originally suggested. Brian Walden, uh, a very great supporter of the Labour Party many years ago, uh, he said uh, this, which uh, fits our category of thinking at the moment, for the conflict that matters in any society is not between different collective institutions, but it's between the state and the individual. Again, worth thinking through. American Constitution, uh, Thomas Paine, he said, Government, even in its best state, is but a necessary evil. In its worst state, it's an intolerable one. Which is the same sort of theme that I was saying to you. Governments are always wasteful. They don't do anything well. We do need them, but they don't actually do things well. So, as Paine said, in its best state, it's a necessary evil. In its worst state, it's an intolerable one. Let's hope we don't get too intolerable. There's a nice anonymous one. I don't know who said it, but uh, it was. Uh, it's well worth repeating. Whoever it was said, government has become that pit of power. That, excuse me. That attracts men and women who can do better for themselves in policy, politics than they could by producing goods and services for consumers in the market. Interesting, of course, because uh, would all of these people telling us how to run our lives in government be good at producing the things that we really want, the goods and services that will raise our standard of living? Uh, this quote suggests that they would have failed there, which is why they're in politics. That's a much easier route for them. There's an American comedian, W.C. Fields, and I use this quite often, and uh, I, I think it's attributed to him, not absolutely certain, but he said it doesn't matter who you vote for, the government always gets in. Remember we had that little narrow ban for politicians left of centre, and we had a little right and left and we were within that narrow band. And basically it doesn't matter whether it's the Tory party or the Labour party in power, they all do the same things, guided by the civil service. Uh, and uh, it's reflected quite nicely in that statement. It does not matter who you vote for, the government always gets in. The economist John Kenneth Galbraith said something interesting. I, I'd like to add something to that. But uh, uh, he said there are those people who don't know and there are those people who don't know they don't know. And of course the people who don't know they don't know, they're the dangerous ones. And so I just added here that uh, the ones that don't know they don't know, they're often the ones who become politicians. They're quite happy to say, yes, we can do this, yes, we can do this. They don't really know what they're talking about. And that's why they repeat the same thing time and time again. You know, they're given lines, just say this, just say this. Um, uh, so they don't really know that they don't understand these things. And those are the dangerous people as far as I, I much prefer those people who don't know, not those people who don't know that they don't know. I don't think any of us like Jean-Claude Juncker. He did say something which I've used uh, uh, within uh, uh, this area. And he said, as politicians, we all know what we have to do. We just don't know how to get re-elected if we do it. I mean, I wouldn't give politicians that much intelligence, um, but there are obviously some people who know what they should do but know that if they do it, they would not get re-elected. You don't remember the vote motif. Um, uh, so they don't do it. Uh, so um, his, as politicians, we all know, I'm not sure they all know uh, what they have to do, uh, but uh, they certainly know how to get elected or know how not to get elected if they do things. So well done, Jean-Claude, about the only interesting thing he ever did. 
Um, another anonymous one, uh, which uh, I find uh, um, useful to refer to on occasions, um, is this one. We elect politicians for telling us what we want to hear, and then we get mad when we find out that they were just telling us what we wanted to hear. How true is that? A good old economist, not uh, uh, you know the father of Keynesianism, but I'll let him off there. He did actually do some good things and say some good things. He did say, by the process of inflation, governments can confiscate secretly, arbitrarily and unobserved an important part of the wealth of their citizens, impoverishing many and enriching some. Great quote. John Maynard Keynes, because that's exactly what inflation does. And one of his other quotations explains that uh, it does it in a way that not one person in a million can understand. And that makes inflation such a, an attractive thing, uh, which is why at the end of 2021, inflation will start to pick up and uh, we won't know why it happened. And governments will excuse themselves, as will the Bank of England, but if you listen to my lectures, we'll know why it happened. It's because we're now expanding rapidly the money supply in the economy, and that's going to lead to a big boom in monetary demand soon when we get out of this uh, uh, lockdown situation that we are in. I said previously that uh, you know my nightmare is moving towards the command economy. Well, someone beat me to it many years ago, Alexis de Tocqueville. He said, a democracy cannot exist as a permanent form of government. It exists until the voters discover that they can vote themselves largesse from the public treasury. The majority always vote for the candidates promising the most benefits. A democracy always collapses over loose fiscal policy. Which is just about where we're at now. So, fingers crossed everybody. The last one or two really in this case, <laughs> uh, the writer of comedy Hilaire Belloc, um, he said, which uh, I've always liked, here richly with ridiculous display the politician's corpse was laid away while all his acquaintances sneered and slanged. I wept for I had hoped to see him hanged. We do give too much credit to politicians uh, and the very last quote there is, is mine because it says the best politicians are the ones that do the least damage. They all do damage. I'm not a fan of politicians as you probably realised and the best ones are just those ones that uh, uh, do less damage rather than more damage. So I wouldn't really go as far as Hilaire Balloch suggested but uh, it made me giggle when I heard it. Now, there are some more lectures that will follow. I will do something on reverse income tax, which does need to explain in more detail so that you can understand how important it is to introduce that system and limit what governments do, give people the money that they need to do things for themselves. If you want to get ahead of me, you can sort of read things uh, on my uh, blog, which is jbhern.wordpress. Dot com, lots of articles supporting the sort of things that I've been talking about here. And uh, uh, join me on Twitter, by all means, so uh, at JB Hearn uh, on Twitter if you want to listen to uh, a few people having uh, interesting discussions about things. Do that. So I hope you've enjoyed that particular lecture, miscellaneous lecture one. There'll be more to come. And... Uh, Enjoy your new year as best you can.